and say go. How's it going, guys? I'm Cody. And this is Eli, and you are watching slash listening to the Commander Cafe. And we wish you guys a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and any other holidays that I may have missed that you celebrate. Happy Solstice this time of year. If you're watching this, the first few days it comes out, you have a few days until New Year's, and we thought we would, bring, we would finish up the year with a top 10 list for the top cards for Commander that came out in 2017. So, how did you pick your top 10 cards? Yeah, so um, so we each had came up with our own list um, separately, and then kind of brought them together. Um, my considerations, we didn't really talk about considerations that we were putting up beforehand. Um, the ones, the, what I looked for in the cards were cards that fit into multiple arch archetypes um, so they would hit a wider range of cards and wider range of decks um, greatly improved a sp specific strategy it would become a staple in that strategy and or it filled weak spots in the color or it just had overwhelming power so that if you got this card out you were probably going to win the game as for me i kind of chose just cards that can go in more decks um i didn't really uh care too much about mana cost so there's a few cards that are kind of expensive even um but i didn't have any like specific decks in mind i did have uh the deck themes that they could kind of go in but i don't know if any would go specifically in any like there, none of these are going to win you the game with uh depending on your deck you can definitely tell our individual play styles with these lists you can see that i care more about the just win more cards the big powerful splashier cards where you go for more of the like accrued value perhaps or the ones that can equate the most fun or mm -hmm. kind of that kind of route yeah i have my my number one card is honestly more of a personal flavor it's my favorite card of the year and i do think it's useful but it's really a hit and miss sometimes yeah all right, so why don't you get us started with your number 10. So my number 10 is Metallic Mimic uh, because it came out in Aether Revolt, and I think it's pretty much perfect for all of the tribal decks that have come out this year. Um, it's a 2-2 two, two artifact, or a 2-mana drop artifact creature that's a 2-1. Uh, it When it enters the battlefield, you choose a creature type, and it is that type in addition to other types. And each creature you control of the chosen type enters the battlefield with an additional 1-1 one, one counter on it. So it's just really a... Uh, it buffs up your creatures, and even once it's gone, it's going to still uh, keep those creatures that came in while it was around alive. However, it's not usually like the first target for someone to eliminate. Yeah. This one's good for, especially for those tribal decks that aren't necessarily strong tribals, or strong tribes. Um, probably like the cats came out this year um, cats don't have a lot of support for them so the fact that this is a lord for any tribe even ones that don't necessarily have strong support for them mm -hmm. and it goes in any color deck is good yeah it was it was one of the considerations I had for when I was considering that Salafid deck but yeah that's... not quite enough support for me no. and what's your um, top 10 my number 10 is Kess Dissident Mage she is a one in Grixis. Gotta love her already. Um, legendary creature, human wizard, 3-4, with flying. And during each of your turns, you may cast an instant or sorcery card from your graveyard. If a card cast this way would be put into your graveyard this turn, exile it instead. So she's on here because she's a high... I think out of all the commanders, I wanted to have at least one legendary creature on my list. And I think out of all the commanders that came out this year, she is probably the highest power level. Or at least has the potential to be the highest power level. Um, it's where because um, it basically extends your hand, so your hand is your graveyard is an extension of your hand. At least during your turn, it's not every turn. Otherwise, they would be borderline broken. Um, but the fact that you can extend your hand by that much and just use your graveyard during your turn um, makes her very powerful. And I think the other interesting clause is if the card would be put into your graveyard this turn, exile it instead. So that means if you're playing a buyback card and you cast it and you pay the buyback cost, it goes back to your hand and not to exile. So the fact that you can get into those kind of loops with her um, makes her very interesting and very fun to play. Yeah, that's really a 
helpful that they threw that in because otherwise it was yeah there's a, a lot that yeah there's a lot of things like this like i know um whip of Erebos says if it would leave the battlefield exile it instead um so the fact that it is going to your graveyard to exile um, makes it a lot better okay moving on to number nine i threw in planar bridge uh it's a six drop legendary artifact uh and its ability is pay eight mana and tap it to search your library for any permanent and put it onto the battlefield and then shuffle your library so pretty much mid to late game you get to cheat out any piece of your deck that you need um besides spells or like instant sorceries mm -hmm. but all those permanents that can easily uh if you have eight mana which usually turn seven or eight you have uh you can have one or two of your best cards out already just because of this if you had this in hand instead of one of those it's a tutor that cheats them out uh just a bit more mana to pay into so yeah the fact that it goes in any color so you can tutor in any color it's definitely a late game bomb and um it's kind of the same thing with kiss while kiss extends your hand with your graveyard it's extended your hand by your whole deck you can pull out exactly what you need at the moment and put it onto the battlefield um the fact that it goes onto the battlefield instead of your hand is is amazing really and the only time only creature you may not want to do that with is like the eldorazi that want to be cast but i think pretty much the few times that i've gotten to play it the only person i was even worried about losing it to was you because you have a lot of like general removal but other than that usually if i can get that out i feel relatively safe that i can probably finish off the game in a couple turns yeah and the fact that artifact removal isn't as prevalent prevalent in the commander as it is like even counter spells so that if like you're tutoring for something and um once this hits it usually sticks around mm -hmm. for quite a while my number nine is anointed procession um it's a three and one white four mana total enchantment if an effect would create one or more tokens under your control it creates twice as many tokens instead so the reason this is here is it's basically parallel lives in white which is the other big token generating color other than green um it's there it's because it's basically become a staple in those um, white token strategies um which there are quite a few out there so any white token strategy from Queen Marquesa so that's making an assassin on your upkeep, uh, Brea that's making Thopters when she comes in, um, Edgar Markov who's making vampire tokens when you cast a vampire, it's just doubling all those can get out of hand extremely quick. And for four mana, um, I don't see any reason those decks wouldn't want to have it in there. Um, it's sitting around $10 right now, which I think is about the same as Parallel Lives, so but I would be a bit surprised if it didn't go up, especially if you if a standard deck comes out around tokens. So now would be a good time to probably pick that up. Yeah, it's been just slowly going up. Mm -hmm. So Okay, my number eight also appears on Cody's list later on. Yeah, this is my uh, number three, I think. So, yeah, number three. So we'll skip yours. Um, you want to do an honorable mention for this slot? Uh, my honorable mention... Uh, almost made it onto the list would probably be uh Viz vizier of the menagerie uh which is three colorless and a green it's a creature naga cleric uh that's three four but it allows you to look at the top card of your library so it's not revealed so you're not showing it off to everyone else but then you can also cast that top card if it's a creature and you can spend mana as though it were any mana uh, color to cast it. So really, it's mana fixing you. It's getting you an extra car card option and letting you free scry. Well, half of scry. Uh, you get to you yep you, you get more knowledge. <laughs> and so you know, like if you see something you really don't want on top, and you have this guy out, maybe crack that evolving wilds or. Mm -hmm shuffle your deck if you yeah. have any sort of fetch lands any way to shuffle your deck um kind of the same idea with um since they's divining top if you, you want ways to kind of shuffle your deck with this mm -hmm. but even then just the extending your hand by one card um as you can see we from our first few picks here we find that very powerful um extending your hand 
kind of like card draw in a way, pseudo card draw. You're getting that extra card to your hand. And I like the, the fact that you don't have to reveal it to your opponents because mm-hmm. a lot of these cards like Oracle, Moldiah and stuff where you reveal, it kind of sh- shows your opponents what's, what's coming up so they can kind of hold back cards that they that can deal with it. Um, this keeping it a secret I think is yeah very powerful. Plus uh, just the mana fixing. That's Chromatic mm-hmm. Lantern right there just with your creatures only. But th- I just found it super helpful. Um it, it was almost on the list, and then I just kept having to kick things off, and so otherwise it was... I, I'd say it's one of the better cards of this year. And then my number eight is Riskar's Expertise. Um, the only expert... I think the best expertise is the only one on my list. Um, they're all good, especially this one and Brawls, but I think this one just edges it out just a little bit. So Riskar's Expertise is four and two green, six mana total for Sorcery, you draw cards equal to the greatest power among creatures you control. You may cast a card with converted mana cost 5 or less from your hand without paying its mana cost. So this is just massive card draw and you get to cheap mana cost. So two of the strongest things you can do in Magic, this is all in one card. Um, and like my Titania deck runs this and even if just her or one of the elementals that she makes is out, that's I'm drawing 5 cards and... After doing that, casting a card for free from my hand. Um, very powerful. You're in green. You're going to have big creatures. Um, you could easily be drawing a lot more than five, but even if it's five or six, you're going to be very happy with that. Um, card draw is always good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I really like the whole es- expertise cycle that came out. Yeah, I think all of them are really good. Some better than others. Um like I said, I think Riskars and Brawls was probably the best that came out, but Yidris likes them a lot, and Yidris can make some broken plays with that. Mm-hmm. Okay, on to number seven. I have uh, Ramunap Excavator, which is the first colored card I have on the list. Um, so it's two colorless and a green. You get a creature, Naga Cleric, um, and for it's two, three. And you can play lands from your graveyards. So it's Crucible of Worlds, but in a creature. And notably, much cheaper than Crucible of Worlds. Right. So, yeah, just... Crucible of Worlds is what? $50, $60 card. This mm-hmm. is under 10 um, It limits you to green, and it's on a stick, so it's easier to remove than um, Crucible of Worlds. But the green isn't going to hurt you too much because most of the cards that decks that want to do something like this, like Titania or Get Rog Monster, have are in green anyway. Mm-hmm. So the main land destruction decks of like self land destruction are green. So mm-hmm. he he is a very nice include. Um, I was pretty happy with that, and I don't even run actual like self land destruction. I just run things that like maybe i'm milling a little extra and so yeah if you're in land yeah self mill like a soul tie self mill like you have or even if you have a bunch of fetch lands just Mm -hmm. the ability to get those back and we use those is very powerful yeah and what's your number seven my number seven is actually the whole series of the flip artifacts um so dowsing dagger primal amulet thematic compass are the big three um but all five of them are Pretty good. Um, the fact that they go, they're functional reprints of lands that are expensive and go in any color. Um, so things like Thematic Compass that flips into basically um, Maze, Maze of Ith. Um, the one that flips into Gilded Lotus. Um, they go, in, they flip into very powerful cards and that are very expensive. And a lot of times I play these and they'll flip that same turn. So I'm not losing that much. Like the um, Maze of Ith one. When it flips that same turn, I can tap it, so it's just like playing Maze of, Maze of Ith, but it's much cheaper to go buy. Um, it's a two-drop, goes in any deck, which Maze of Ith does also, but um, overall, I'm really happy that they did these kind of flip cards this way, because um, it gave us functional reprints of a lot of expensive cards, um, so I can actually play them now. Yeah, uh, and then one thing I noticed that they had done that uh, I was really kind of is a subtle but helpful thing 
is like Spires of Orkaza, which is the Maze of Ith, still can tap for mana, mm-hmm. just like the uh, Gia's Cradle one. Yep. Uh, Gia's Cradle actually only does the tap green for each creature you control, whereas uh, the Itlamok one has tap for green, or you can tap it for that. So I thought that was a nice little... Mm-hmm. Just extra feature they threw in. Yeah, that's very true. Like the original Maze of Ith, I wouldn't even count it as a as one of my land slots because it doesn't actually tap for mana. It's very much like the um, Glacial Chasm. Since they don't tap for mana unless there's like a um, Ur- Urborg out, then it, you, it's hard to count those as actual land drops. Um, but this, since it can tap for mana, does still count as a land drop. Well, doesn't count as a land drop, but I count it as kind of a half ramp card in most of these flip cases. So. Mm-hmm. Okay, so number six. So I started this one off with Ramos the Dragon Engine, which is the only commander I have on my list, because he's a six drop uh, legendary artifact creature dragon, which is a 4 4 with flying, and whenever you cast a spell, put a 1 1 counter on Ramos Dragon Engine for each of that spell's colors. As In addition, you can remove five 1 1 counters from him to add two of each color in Wooburg, so 10 mana total, to your mana pool, and you can only activate that ability once each turn. However, that alone is already super helpful for... I would say this key can work for if you want to make a deck five colors. Mm -hmm. The majority of the time, if you don't actually have a five-color commander for a five-color deck, go with him, because... If you're using five colors, he's going to get tons of counters. He can go Voltron on his own, but you can still be working towards your other strategy. Mm-hmm. Or you can go all in for the other strategy. I could see him easily going in like a Spell Slinger mm-hmm. or uh, pretty much... He, he has a wide variety of options. Yeah, there's a lot of times where like you want the five colors, so you build a five color deck, but your commander actually doesn't have anything to do with the five colors or the strategy of the deck, so you end up not playing him. You're just using him for the five colors. Ramos, he still has use, even if you're not building around him. Like, he can still be useful. Like, even just tossing him out if you have nothing else on turn six. And you, having that ability available to you. He's just, like, a, what, a 4-4 flyer. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's still a good threat on his own. Um, this one was also, it was my flip up between this and Kess. I think Kess is on her own more powerful um, build around. But... I think Lamos is more fun and has more combo potential down the road. Um, also, the like doing it once per turn is worth noting that like if you flicker him out, like if you activate his ability, get the five mana, flicker him out, and then he comes back in like an instant flicker. Um, that resets. So then you start casting the cards. If you get up to five um, counters again then you can activate that build again. So if you have Deadeye out with him, like you can play your hand out yeah. pretty easily. Uh, an extra thing that I really like about him is that in five colors, you do have a little bit of trouble with mana colors. Um, and because he's six colorless, it's super easy to, if somehow you just got all of your forests, mm-hmm. uh, still play him out. You can do a little bit of attacking, I don't know if slowly I'd be playing, build up, and then... Yeah. I don't know if I'd be playing six forest if I was playing a six-color deck, but yeah. Five. <laughs> Five-color yeah. deck. Overall, just in case that, that occasional time happens, or you, you happen to just have a whole bunch of colorless mana rocks, and you don't have the colors for your spells, mm-hmm. I, I could see him yeah. coming in in those kind of tough times, too. Yeah, very good. My number six is Lifecrafter's Bestiary. Um, so Lifecra- Lifecrafter's Bestiary is a three-drop artifact, and at the beginning of your upkeep, scry one. Whenever you cast a creature spell, you may pay green. If you do, draw a card. I almost wish that second part wasn't there, um, just because it does limit you to green. Um, like, I would pay a three-mana, probably a two-mana artifact that said at the beginning of your upkeep, scry one. Um, that ability on its own is very good. You're going to... So every, I think, third scry, every time you scry three, it's, it's the equivalent of drawing a card. Um, so it's going to give you card advantage down the road, and it's sustained. So it's like every turn it's going to happen. Um, and the fact that it also gives you card draw in green that doesn't have the easiest time to have constant recurring 
a card draw is also very good. So card draw, card advantage, all in one card. Um, one of my favorite cards, actually, that I've put in all my green decks now. Yeah, I've, I've really liked that one. I was considering, uh, in general, using that for a couple of my green decks, but then I couldn't find my copies. <laughs> I even got a FOMO version, which is <laughs> really nice. Pre-release FOMO. Okay, moving uh, on to... Your, your number five is my number one, so let's one, go with Once again, I'll, I'll kind of go off on uh, some high-up picks. Um, one of your honorable mentions. Yeah, honorable mentions. So this one requires a little bit of color specifications of it needs to have both black and green, but Winding Constrictor, for one black and one green, you get a creature snake that is a 2-3... And if one or more counters would be placed on an artifact or creature you control, that many of those counters plus one are placed on that permanent instead. If you would get one or more counters, you get that many of those counters plus one instead. So my thoughts with this one were Marin's getting er, back to being pretty popular, even though she never really dropped too far, thanks to Commander Anthology. Mm -hmm. And there's just plenty of strategies. This goes into Trexa and everything else. Um... Just a lot of those counter strategies tend to use at least green and black. Um, I know a lot of, like, my Abzan deck, yeah, which you... just adds white. This is in there. It was one of the first cards I included uh, for Anafenza. Get all those plus one, plus one counters. Get those experience counters with Marin. Um, if you're like me and you build a black-green fungus tribal deck that cares about spore tokens, um, very fun deck. <laughs> definitely a bit lower on the power level but still it, very fun it, it held its own enough that yeah. I, I think we'll probably end up having a deck tech for it down the line yeah um yeah it's definitely a great card it's dominating standard for a reason um mm -hmm. you can still like you can run the combo with the uh walking ballista and yeah. just have him out with a ton of cards it's just a great but, old but yeah i could i could i could see him <laughs> dominating a lot of those uh definitely atrexa is another of the popular ones that he's in yeah so back um, to yours we're on number five yep of mine um i have hour of revelation so it is three and white 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 for a sorcery hour devastation costs three less to cast if there are 10 or more non-land permanents on the battlefield destroy all non-land permanents so basically what this reads in most situations is white, 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 destroy all non-land permanents. That's enchantments, artifacts, creatures, planeswalkers, everything for three mana. Not much else to say. Like I know white is already the best on board wipes, but if you're in white and if you're in one or two colors um, and you can afford to do the triple white, I I would definitely be running this in there. Yeah, it is... I, I was pretty amazed with just how powerful it is. I think I run it in send triplets still, mm -hmm. and even with the kind of strict mana cost, that's been one of those board wipes that I'm always glad to have. Yeah. The fact that it hits non -land, all non-land permanents, um, I wouldn't run it in a deck that runs a lot of artifacts or enchantments, because in those you want more creature board wipes. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're playing an enchantress deck, don't be running this, but um, anything else it's a good emergency hit yeah that in mind i also always have dark steel forge out when i yeah, cast true. that stuff <laughs> my stuff is safe um number four number yeah. four is inspiring statuary so it's a three drop artifact notice i really like artifacts um and non-artifact spells you ha cast have Improvise, which allows you to tap your artifacts to pay for colorless, so each one counts for one. Mm -hmm. So on its own, it counts as a mana rock for everything except artifacts. Yep. And then in addition, all of those extra artifacts you might have that maybe they're not doing much, or even artifact creatures if you have those, uh, they can all still be tapped to help cast stuff. Um, and I find there's just enough artifacts in Commander that a lot of people will include because they have nice abilities that you can now also tap them. It's also good if you want to do some of the kind of evil combos of 
either paradox engine to help uh, make this infinite or near, near, near infinite, infinite not yeah. not actually infinite or you can just do some slightly mean things like cast a spell using your howling mind so only you draw an extra mm -hmm. card <laughs> which th those are yeah. some of the fun things is all those older artifacts that have effects only if they're not tapped because yeah. now there's not many ways to tap them this gives you a using this with winter orb and just being like nope i get to untap all my stuff you guys don't mm -hmm. is good um yeah, I, I run this in my Brea deck, and I got into a big chain with Paradox Engine where you just, like, tap all your stuff, play something, everything untaps, tap it all again, play something else. That's, like, it's not quite infinite, but it's good enough in most cases. It was for me to get my infinite combo out um, in her. But, yeah, just the having that ability to tap those artifacts, like Vidalcan Orrery, Paradox Engine, um, Unwinding Clock, all these artifacts that don't tap to do anything they just do stuff on their own now they have that added ability to tap and it doesn't affect what they can do this mm -hmm. is good yeah this was th this card holds a little special place in my heart just like brawl's expertise because I, I had a fun standard deck that used a lot of some fun shenanigans and it was actually doing pretty well yeah. but that that's what made me kind of put this card over some of the others is i, I know from experience that I've done a lot of fun things with it. Yeah, and even those decks that have, like my Blade deck that has a bunch of artifacts in it, it has a bunch of non-artifact cards in there too, so it's not like it's going to ever be a dead card, even in a dedicated artifact deck. Yeah, my, so. my Send Triplets runs it, and like, what, 40 plus percent of the deck is... Mm -hmm. Is artifacts or yeah. non-artifacts, yeah. I have artifact so. lands, jeez. Yep, <laughs> same. So what's good. your number four? My number four is also your number three, I believe. So we'll we can talk about it at the same time. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say we can do it right now. Yeah, since you'll be going doing it next anyway. Um, that is, it is growing rights of Itlamog, which is two and one green, three drop total legendary enchantment. Whenever growing rights of Itlamog enters the battlefield, look at the top four cards of your library. You may reveal a creature card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in any, any order. So automatically, that right there, card selection, you get to look at the top four, is going to be good on its own. Then, at the beginning of your end step, if you control four or more creatures, you transform Rites of Itlamog. And it transforms into Itlamog, Cradle of the Sun, which is basically a better guy's cradle. Because it taps for one green mana, or it taps and adds one green mana for each creature you control. So the reason this is actually better than Guy's Cradles, like we talked about earlier, is even after a board wipe, after a board wipe, Guy's Cradle doesn't tap for anything. So it's a dead land on the board. With this, even if you have no creatures on the board, it still taps for mana. So, An added bonus is this card is currently, at the time of us recording on the 27th, uh, it is uh, $5. Whereas at this current moment as well, Gia's Cradle is sitting at two hundred and seventy-two dollars oh, and ninety-nine cents. Exactly. This is Average. where, um, yeah, this is where we were talking. Like these flip lands, they just give us a functional reprint of cards that we pro most of us wouldn't get to play otherwise. Like I'm never going to own a Gia's Cradle, um, but I do own a couple copies of this. I'm kind of sad that it dropped quite that much because I remember I opened a foil one of these on the opening weekend. Uh, I think it was even at the pre-release, maybe, and it was worth fifty dollars at the time. Now I think it's like gone down to ten, but um, still a great card. And because of this, one twenty-five, twenty-five. Okay, still not too bad. <laughs> um, so on a side note, with all these um, flip lands, I do, I am finding it more um, relevant. I guess would be the right word to use of running targeted land removal. Um, Ghost Quarters even, or something like that. Because we weren't running into a bunch of Gaia's Cradles before. Now we're running into cards like this, that there are lands, and you do need to remove them, or they're going to go out of control. So having that target and land removal is something that I think is going to become part of the meta as these cards become more and more popular. Um, but we'll have to see how that goes. And I'd also like to note that while this is my number three on the list... 
I was really refraining from using any of them on the list just because if I did, I would have to include them all and they would have taken up probably at least mm. five out of the ten cards. Unless you cheat like I do and put all the flip artifacts in yeah. one line. However, I really mm. like the enchantments as well. They were yeah. they were pretty helpful for their colors. Mm-hmm. I um, think green is definitely... The, this one is probably the best out of them. But, yeah. Um, just like the expertise. like They're all pretty good in their own way. So, while well, we've kind of seen my number three, your number three was my number, I think, eight, which we skipped yes. over. So, so we'll go ahead and go through that. Let's go to that. I keep trying to take all my, all my credit early on. Um, <laughs> which I'm actually surprised this is higher on my list than yours because you run it more than I do, I believe. But I actually run it in every commander yeah. deck. <laughs> um, so my number three, his number eight, is Mirajmir. is a three-drop artifact. Um, and you pay two, and Mirage Mirror becomes a copy of target artifact, creature, enchantment, or land until end of turn. That's it. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's... <laughs> uh, I, I had some fun reading some of the rulings on this card um, and confirmed that unless it's, like, Beast Within, destroy a target permanent, this card can escape almost any type of uh, removal because destroy target artifact... Turn it, copy a creature that's on the field or copy mm-hmm. a land it that trigger happens first and then it fizzles so many different things the only way to actually remove it is to remove uh or after it's become something then remove it but a lot of the time people just try and remove it after they've seen what it can do not yeah. while it's in action and so it's really kind of a very good toolbox utility uh, I found it's useful in just every deck that I've used it in, it's come in handy at some point. Even just copying the biggest creature on the field and then using that as a blocker. like mm-hmm. Even if you just do that for two mana to save your life, um, life total, it's going to be good. Yeah, I've had it turn into Ulamog's The Ceaseless Hunger, <laughs> and I got to exile 40 cards total from nice. someone's deck just because two turns in a row, they just left it out. And- not much can be done about that. You can copy their, um, if they have a Gilded Lotus, any artifact that taps for something more than two, um, it's worthwhile doing that. Lands that tap for a few, like a Gaia's Cradle type, Itlamog type effect. Mm -hmm. It's going to be good. All right, let's go with your number two, which I'm still mad at myself. When I saw this on your list, I don't know how I didn't have this on my list because I love this card. So I've personally never even gotten to use this card because the one deck it's in, I haven't drawn it. I don't think I've gotten to use it either. Maybe that's why it wasn't on my list is because I've never actually seen it in action. I know it's good, but it's too expensive to have multiple copies. (laughs) Yeah, so this card raised the price of the vampire deck quite a bit. The commander's 17. Teferi's Protection. It is an instant for two colorless and one white until your next turn, your life total can't change, and you have protection from everything. All permanents you control phase out, and then exile to fairy's protection. So you are basically shielding yourself from anything that could happen. The only way to stop this is a counter spell that someone had to have, which usually you're using this in response to whatever they're doing to you. So mm-hmm. I would say it's if you're running white, unless you're on a budget because this is an expensive card, this is probably an auto include for th- this card alone made me reassured that in my decision to buy the vampire deck, yeah. and I'm still considering buying more vampires just for this card. Same, like that. If this was a big reason I bought the vampire deck was because I saw this card in there. Um, I wish they had printed it more in more of the precons, um, like the cats as well, just to make it a little more, more available, more printings out there. But it's just such a weird card because like that, the whole protection from everything, everything is almost like a unstable kind of like wording. You have protection mm-hmm. from everything. Like it's such a weird thing to actually read on a legitimate magic card. It makes yeah. me think of Rules Lawyer. Like, mm-hmm. Rules Lawyer is less broken than this is, except it stays out longer. Yeah. Like, you can still bounce a Rules Lawyer to their hand, mm-hmm. and then they go back to normal. This one, just once once you phase out, you're, you're good until your next turn. 
No one else can do anything to you. I really want to do a, in response to the Teferi's protection, a glorious end, end the turn, <laughs> and then lose the game on my next end step. Like, <laughs> I always say that's worth it. Like, that would be fun. Yeah. But, fun little but it is horrible hard to deal combos, with. but fine. <laughs> it's hard to deal with, and it buys you that turn. And a lot of times, like, if you're going against combo decks, buying that one extra turn, a lot of times they'll just be out of options after that turn. They'll use up all their resources. And then you're good. You can usually handle them from there on out. I mean, even if you just... If you're ahead of everyone, board-wise, and someone uses a board wipe, you can use this. All of their stuff is gone. They just used all their mana on a board wipe, and you're probably going to at least kill one person next turn. Yeah. Yeah, definitely a good card. Um, My number two is, as foretold, it's two and one blue um, for an enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, put a time counter on as foretold. Once each turn, you may pay zero rather than pay the mana cost for a spell you cast with converted mana cost X or less, where X is the number of time counters on as foretold. Cheating mana cost, always good. The fact that you can do this in blue is borderline broken, I would say, um, because you can do it every turn. So this only has to be out for two or three turns or rotations at the table and you can counter spell people for free um which is one of the most broken things to do in magic is just leaving no mana up and still being able to counter spell um things like foil or mana or not mana the other one that you can pay on your upkeep zero pact of negation yeah and counter thing um is good but yeah just a clause in there that's every turn so if you have a deck with lots of instants control decks very good in there, and it's just it, it can get out of hand and be a huge ramp if you drop this on turn three. Um, Must have for like brawl counter decks and stuff like that. Yep. Yeah. Anything that wants to play on other turns, uh, rush me. Um, definitely. Definitely wants this one. Um, huge ramp can just get out of hand. The fact that you're cheating man costs every turn, even if it's only your turn to cast like a two drop on your second and leaving you mana to do a five drop as well is gonna be good mm-hmm. okay finally on those number one number one cards <laughs> i'm gonna have a lot to talk about on mine <laughs> mine like i said before is just a flavor choice i personally love this card i am buying more so that i can put them in any decks that use both white and blue but it came out in the commander 2017 dragon precon fractured identity So it's three colorless, a white, and a blue. For a sorcery, exile target non-land permanent, which on its own, I would almost be willing to pay five mana for anyways. Probably not, but (laughs) I'd consider it. Well, you're in white, so there's better options for that. Yeah. Uh, However, each player other than its controller creates a token that's a copy of it. And with some of the cards that I've seen this used on, it just spirals the game out of control. It adds some chaos. Uh, we've seen it cause everyone to gain just ridiculous amounts of life. Uh, we've seen it uh, completely anything, mess up dragons and stuff. Yeah. Anything that has an ETB effect is amazing. I think the last one we saw was the enchantment of... Which one was it? The Authority of the Consuls that mm-hmm. every time a creature enters the, enters the battlefield, you gain one life. So everyone at the table, except for the original person who played that card, had it, and that game lasted so long. <laughs> oh, and there was also that uh, game where you had something out, and they fractured identity, and it passed it to the other two players, and then one of those players got wiped out. So basically, it was just, he stole your card from you, yep. and it was something you wanted. I just really can't remember, because I wasn't a part of that game. If it's a card in my deck, I want it, so... Yeah. <laughs> But mainly a flavor choice. It's two of my three favorite colors uh, goes in any of my Esper decks, which I have far too many for the limited mana base I have. <laughs> but yeah, that's so what it comes down to. It always comes down to that mana base. That is my number one is Fractured Identity. What is your number one? My number one is also your, what, number five, I think it was? Yeah. Um, that we skipped. It's, I can't, why do you have this so low? This is such a good card. Um, Paradox Engine, it's 5 mana um, for a legendary artifact. 
Whenever you cast a spell, untap all non-land permanents you control. Um, when I first had this, I actually asked you guys to if I could play with Brea with this starting in my hand because I wasn't sure I wanted to keep it in the deck because the fact that it doesn't untap your lands, I don't think it's as good as people think it is. You have to have other cards to set up to take advantage because if you're just doing it for the pseudo vigilance, um, reconnaissance does a better job. Um, it's a it sticks you in white, but it's a one or two drop enchantment that you pay zero to un untap your creature after combat. So um, if you're doing it for pseudo vigilance, not worth it. If you can have a bunch of mana rocks, or you can make your creatures mana rocks with your inspiring sanctuary, um, then it's definitely good. Fate Stitcher. Fate uh, Stitcher. Um, that's how you can make this go near infinite is things like that where you're yeah. using them to untap lands or yeah untapping lands to yeah you can do a lot of crazy stuff with it um but there's a lot of whispers of banning this card already and i disagree with that um if you have proper targeting if you have artifact removal um which you should have at least one in every deck that you can uh mono red i know is a bit tough but um chaos warp this isn't a bad target for that if you're really concerned it's not degenerate, and it doesn't stop me from playing. It doesn't stop people from playing their decks. So just because I have this out, you can still play your cards. Like I'm not Leovolding and saying you can't play your decks. I can't, or Blood Moon, and you can't play your cards. Um, then if if I had a choice between Winter Orb and this, uh, if I had, my opponents were either going to play Winter Orb or this, I would much rather play against this than Winter Orb. Yes, I know you're looking at all my reasonings. I have. I'm very passionate about this. <laughs> Um, it doesn't win you the game on the spot. There's infinite combos that can win you the game on the spot with two cards. This doesn't win you the game. It gets you there. It gives you accumulated value over time. Um, if you're playing artifact heavy deck anyway, then Unwinding Clock does it at each person's turn also. So there, there's that. It doesn't do anything the turn it comes into play because a lot of times you're playing this and you don't have the mana to cast another spell to untap everything. So turn it comes in, it does nothing most of the time. Um, decks built around it with Kavoke, Improvise, lots of mana rocks. Yeah, they're going to be good with it. And the pseudo vigilance, like I said, Reconnaissance, if you're in white, does a better job of that anyway. So is it ban worthy? No. Is it the best card in 2017? I think so. You think it's the fifth best? It's definitely up there. Um, but I think there's cards that or more ban worthy out there than this dead eye um dead eye what's the seaborn muse they're probably more broken than i think than this now on the note <laughs> of paradox engine i just want to give a general warning to all other people do not allow the brea player to <laughs> start with this in their hand it's not going to work out well for anyone else at the table <laughs> <laughs> i <laughs> I played this today in Brea, and it got me moved on the very next turn. I got to do nothing with it. And it was just like, well, oh, okay, yeah. I mean, I got it back because Brea is good at recurring, but it was still annoying because I spent five mana for nothing. It, it is one of the cards, though, for making, like, it. if you're going to have a lot of combos in Brea, which is what she's mainly known for, uh, this is one of those pieces that, combined with quite a few other options will make her go infinite with just casting herself over and over even yeah but like i said even then there's she has easier ways to go infinite than with this so mm -hmm. worthy. i don't think so I, 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 I yeah i'm not usually terrified of it when it gets played even with like it's like okay they're going to combo off and win they probably were going to do that anyway mm -hmm. um and then there were plenty of honorable mentions. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a I'm trying to see. long list. And yeah, we actually have some shared things on our Yeah, list. we have a lot of shared stuff. Um, some we've talked about. Marisil was one for me. Um, I love that deck. It's the... Out of all the um, commanders that came out this year, he's my favorite, even though I don't believe he's the most powerful. Um, Eli might disagree with me on that because he can be quite powerful in the right deck. Um, which you had <laughs> um, and Connor would agree as well yeah Connor was a bit salty which you'll see he, he's still salty from months ago from me 
in response to him board wiping on turn five or four. One five, no, it was five. Turn five, taking him from forty life to three life with my Marisol deck. Um, it's a powerful deck. He's a powerful commander. Um, does get a bit of hate, but the funny thing is, the more he's hated out, the stronger he becomes. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's part of the reason I like it. So even if they remove it, they're just going to make him better in the future anyway. So it's not overly concerning. Um, so that's one of my honorable mentions. Another honorable I'd like to throw in is just Yeheni Undying Artisan. Uh, two colorless and a black for a legendary creature. It's a 2-2. Two, two. He has haste. Whenever an opponent con- uh, a creature an opponent controls dies, put a 1-1 counter on him, and you can sacrifice another creature to give him indestructible, because he's a sack outlet for pretty cheap. He has plenty of other effects, and I could easily see commander decks made out of him. Mm-hmm. I haven't looked him up actually specifically with what some of those are, but I'm fairly certain he could... He's in my Marquesa, the Black Rose deck, um, because of the 1-1 counters, indestructible, sack outlet. Just the sack outlet alone on him makes him good. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, strong commander. Strong part of the... I think probably better in the 99 of decks, but yeah, can still he, be built around. He has... He, he's a very just good, utility, useful card to have. Yeah. And then one of both of our honorable mentions is the Locust God, and... Um, You want to read that one? So it's a legendary creature god for four colorless and a red and a blue. It has flying. Um, It's a 4-4. Whenever you draw a card, create a 1-1 blue and red insect token with flying and haste. In addition, you can pay two colorless, a red, and a blue to draw a card, then discard a card. And when he dies, return it. Uh, to its owner's hand at the beginning of the next end step. So a whole lot of useful effects all crammed into one. Is it loves to draw cards. Mm-hmm. So he is great at the helm of decks. He is great in like a Niv-Mizzet deck. He's uh, great in my Gyra deck. Gyra. Yeah. Um, I, pl- I built this deck for a while and played with it. You play a lot of will effects to just draw seven cards every turn making hasty the fact that the insects have haste i think might have been a mistake like that makes him extremely powerful the fact that you can draw a ton of cards and just swing with flyers that turn um makes him a very powerful build around commander yeah with the right draw spells in hand which if you just have a whole deck of draw spells with him can almost work uh it does work yeah (laughs) you could easily swarm someone out in one turn if you're just yeah, targeting swarm, one person literally swarm them out yeah <laughs> you're gonna send a whole horde of locusts horde of locusts you're gonna have all the cards in your deck in your hand which means you're probably going to end up comboing off and winning some other way because you're an is it that's like the best spell slinger yeah yeah he's very good um also we had solemnity um which I wish I could find space for him more of my decks. Um, mostly because he combos like so well with um, Glacial Chasm. Anything that has age counters or anything that has counters that you don't want is going to be good. If you have someone who plays Infects a lot in your playgroup, this mm-hmm. help, helps shut them down. Um, it's just in our meta, it's not huge. We don't have an attractive player. We don't have an Infect player other than me. Um, so... It's not. I don't have a big reason to put it in my deck other than comboing with Glacial Chasm, which if you do pull that off, you're basically unkillable at that point unless they have enchantment or land removal. Um, yeah, it's one of the cards but, that I kind of have difficulty justifying. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know it was super easy to justify in Zur, where I was just Tutoring anytime wanted. I wanted, I could grab Glacial Chasm. Uh, and someone's going to try and kill me, so just attack with Zur, pull out Solemnity, play Glacial Chasm, and I'm pretty much untouchable unless they go for enchantment destruction or uh, land destruction, which is fairly uncommon in metas unless they have a lot of problem lands or enchantments. Like someone playing Zur. Yeah. So Uh. basically, if you have a Zur player in your playgroup, Hope they don't find out about this combo. However, if you've been playing against him long enough, 
you're probably already prepared, so good on you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this is it's one that I, I like. I said I wish I could fit into more decks. It's just it it's so hard to combo with um, unless you build a deck around not having counters, which is a weird deck. Um, but I mean, you have to have a combo centric deck that is non non counters. Which non counters. I can't think of any, but. Merit Lodge, however, that's kind of a expensive card just to hope that you have Solomonia at the same time. Yeah. If you also, the other thing is if you're playing against a deck that has a lot of the, um, if your meta has a lot like Marins and Mizizits, mm-hmm. where they have the um, experience counters, this helps shut them down. Yeah. So it does, it, it works better if your meta is built to take advantage of it, I think, but. Um. Other than that, that's, I think, all we have for 2017. Yep. Um, Here's to 2018 being a great year for Commander. Um, returning back to Dominaria in 2018, so should be a good year. I'm excited for it. Masters 25, hopefully. Mm-hmm. I'm really hopeful that that has some uh, Commander cards in it. But 2017, I think, was a great year for Commander. We had a bunch of good stuff. The pre-cons, I think I like 2016 a bit better, but 2017 was great pre-cons. Um, the whole, um, not Ravnica, uh, Kalidus block. The whole Kalidus block was amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact that you have all those artifacts that are high power, like you saw on our list. Most of, a lot of our list was artifacts because they fit into any deck. Um, so they can help, help fill those weak spots into those colors that need it. Um, so Yeah. So if you guys have future ideas for us, let us know in the comments. Uh, hit us up on Twitter, uh, Commander Cafe. Yep. Uh, I have my account, Commander Eli. Uh, I'm Mine, usually re-blogging yeah. or retweeting. Um, Mine is at Objector. It's zero B J E C T R. It's still from my gaming channel. Um, we'll leave links in the comments. Yeah, we'll leave links down there. Um, we will be starting looking at if you want to submit a deck for us to look at and um, kind of do a deck doctor's type of idea for it. We'll be looking into doing something like that as well. So feel free to um, send us a DM on Twitter, on YouTube. Let us know. Give us a link to your, uh, or even in the comments below, leave us a link to tapped out of the deck list, and we'll take a look at it. And I'm not saying we'll get to every one, but uh, we'll take a look at them and see what we can make a episode out of. And if you like our videos, go ahead and share us on Facebook or anything else because. The further we get, the more or the sooner we can start doing things like giveaways. I am perfectly fine with going out and buying some stuff just to send to you guys if you guys let your friends know. Get as many people as you can. Uh, I think right now we're at 25 subscribers. I think we'll do our first giveaway with 100 subscribers. So I am down for that. We can uh, start. I've already had ideas in my head for things that I can buy for giveaways. So. So get the word out there, guys. Make sure to like, favorite, um, subscribe, and hit that bell button so you get all the notifications. Um, I think that's it. Till next time. We're out. Have a have a good New Year. Yep. Happy New Year's, guys. Bye.